Today I'm joined by Joseph Policy Farkas. Joseph is Olympian 2016 representing Canada in the fencing discipline Sabre. Biggest achievements in his career so far, multiple medals at the Pan Am Games, highest ever world ranking for a Canadian fencer, and five years in a row ranked number one in Canada. Joseph is also a podcast host and has a different, no, not a different, interesting podcast where we speak about later. Welcome, Joseph. Hi, thank you for having me, Christian. Joseph, can you quickly take us through the different disciplines of fencing and how they differ from each other? Yeah, so fencing has three weapons. Uh, not too many people know that already, uh, which are completely different one from the other. So I do the one called the saber, uh, and the other two are called the epée and the foil. And how they differ is pretty much everything. The, the weapon, uh, the way it's made, the way it works, uh, the equipment is different, uh, the rules... Uh, so we could do a, a whole other podcast on all the separate uh, things, but the, the most important thing to know is that it's like three different weapons that are it's like a different sport. So I've never done the other two. I do mainly saber, uh, and the main difference with saber with the other ones is that it's a it's a blade that you hold upwards and not pointing direct at your opponent, and you slash with the outside part of the blade. You don't have to hit just with the tip with a point, uh, and uh, the only valid target is from the torso up. So everything above the waist is, is valid, but nothing in the legs or the feet, uh, that, none of that counts. Uh, and the point system is more complex than the other two, meaning the only way you could get a point is if you have deemed to have the attack priority, meaning if you're advancing and your opponent's going back and you touch at the same time, well, it's a person advancing who gets the point. So it's all about trying to get that attack and, and on defense trying to make the guy miss his attack and try to take your attack over, right? Uh, but, you know, obviously... Uh, we don't start by having the attack and defense. You have to try and wrestle it away from your opponent with tactics and tricks and tempo and distance. So uh, that's a very interesting sport that's always a challenge. So if I understand you correctly, there's no one who does different disciplines, two or three? No, you know, it's, it's too specialized. Uh, it's too complex. Uh, very different uh, abilities required and tactics. So, um, you know, if you want to be good at one, it's very hard to... to to specialize in another one as well. So I've never touched the other two weapons, actually. Never done them. Okay, cool. Also in Olympic history, is there anyone who did more than one? Uh, maybe in the beginning. I think in the beginning when there was less competition, uh, it was easier to do three and, you know, play around with all of them. But it's become way too competitive, hmm. uh, way too specialized. So it's very hard. There is one girl on the international stage now. Uh, she's one of the top uh, fencers in the world for a weapon called Foil. And she's trying to do Saber as well. Uh, she did the competition. She's had some okay results, actually. Uh, but uh, I don't know if it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out or not. Uh, but that she's the only one who's ever um, attempted that. And she's trying to qualify as a two-weapon two Olympian, which would be pretty interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, in your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? Yeah, so um, I had a uh, concussion uh, in 2014. Uh, right before the beginning of the Olympic qualifications, uh, which which made me lose all my funding. I couldn't uh, go outside. I couldn't work out. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't be with friends in loud environments. Uh, and, you know, everyone else at the same time around the world was training to get ready for the Olympic qualifications. So it was added stress for me and pressure. Uh, so that was definitely one of the toughest times because I was, I was unable to do anything, uh, you know. So... Uh, that's, that's what was, you know, making me even more sad and anxious. And I remember times where I would just be home all day, just looking at a ceiling or walking around in the house and not knowing what the heck to do because everything was, was an uh, irritant and I couldn't even, you know, watch TV or, um, honestly, it was the worst time of my life. So when, when I was able to come out of that, uh, and be able to miraculously come back, make a comeback and, and make some good results, uh, to try and make a Rio, Uh, that was that was a huge huge success for me. And when was that? How, how so long yeah before? so so in, in 2014 uh, I got the concussion uh, and then I started training uh, for for the Olympics. After that I was out for around five six months, <clears throat> and then um, I still have some issues today. But uh, I got over most of them. Uh, but I, I I had to do a lot of specialized training uh, with specialists three times a week. 
but I, I returned now after that to competition and I, I managed to qualify for the Rio 2016 Olympics. So it was, it was around five years ago. Okay. And what did you learn from that moment? Yeah, I, I learned a lot because um, when, I, when I came back from that concussion and I was able to finally just go back on the fencing strip and do my sport, I was so grateful and just happy to be back that even the, the whole pressure of making the Olympics or if I would make it or not, like, it didn't even really matter to me as much anymore. I was just happy to be able to do my activity and, and do what I love again, that uh, it sort of removed a lot of pressure I had put on myself. And, and I learned how important it is just to enjoy the journey and be grateful for it more than just trying to qualify for an Olympic Games. Because um, in 2012, I tried to qualify and I was, you know, 100%. I was training two times a day. We had a coach from Russia who was training us. And uh, I was very close to making it. I didn't make it and I was devastated. And I felt like everything was useless and, and served nothing because I didn't qualify. And I attached my identity to uh, being an, uh, qualifying for an Olympics. And, and that crushed me. And I learned from the second time around where, you know, I had all these issues and I managed to qualify afterwards with even having, you know, been sidelined for a long time, that it was really more about appreciating the journey, being grateful and the anxiety, not anxiety of the consequences of just enjoying the moment that really gave me a perspective uh, to, to, to understand what it really means to, 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 to go for something big. It's not just about achieving it. It's the person you become on the way to achieving that goal. Hmm, that's really interesting. I would yeah. think it must be a balancing act because as an athlete, you have goals, right? You set goals yeah. you want to achieve. But on the other side, you say you want to enjoy the journey. How do you do that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very tough because, like I said, when you're athletes, you, you're always based on your goals and, and, and achievements. And obviously, I had, I had to tell myself, listen, if, if you don't qualify for real, you have to be okay with that. Uh, because you, at least you know you tried everything, you know, and you know I I think I would have been okay with it at that time, but maybe it's 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 still a disappointment if you don't hit your goals. Uh, but because they're ambitious goals, you can't you can't attach your identity to them because so few people make it, and it's so difficult that it shouldn't undervalue everything you've done because you've actually become grown as a person trying to achieve that goal, and that's what you should take with you in other places of your life that are going to help you because. You know, if you make it to the Olympics, you don't make it to the Olympics. It's because of, you know, a couple of competitions that went good or bad. But you put the same effort in, you put the same work to become an Olympian. So it doesn't mean that you're not really an Olympian just because you had, you know, one or two bad days or a couple of bad results. You still are an Olympian in terms of going for that goal and doing everything that's necessary. So you have to be okay with that. And I think with, with other goals, you know, if, if you're just chasing to make, you know, a million dollars, but you're not enjoying the process, I think getting a million dollars would be good. But... You won't be as happy or fulfilled. You always try to get something else and to, to fill that void. So you have to be okay with the journey on the way to it. Okay. What was your best moment? Yeah, so my best moment was, uh, was definitely um, uh, showing up, uh, being at the opening ceremonies of the Olympics because uh, my family was there and everyone who had supported me uh, during my concussion, my problems, all made the trip and were in the stadium with me. And just coming out in that stadium, uh, there were so many people around me from, you know, Team Canada when we came out that started crying because they themselves had so many issues getting there. You know, some people almost died. Uh, and there were amazing stories that came that, 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 that I learned about. Uh, and just to be with those people and be with my and know my family is in there. Uh, it was just uh, a culmination of 15 years of work uh, that we ended up being there, you know, so it, it's just. It's just something that once again that proved to me how important it is to to appreciate those around you and and understand how uh, how much that support is important because uh, you know without them I wouldn't be able to be there anyway. So just to live it with them at the same time was incredible and to live it with other athletes who had similar stories. It's it's a, it's a unique place to be in the world and very hard to recreate anywhere else. Hmm, I believe that. If you could go back in time, 10, 15 years, what advice would you give your younger you? I, w I would say to, to, to be patient. Uh, don't, uh, don't try to uh, rush things because, like I said, uh, it's a long journey. So sometimes when I was younger, you know, I, I, I wouldn't get a result I wanted and it would get me upset. And I almost stopped, uh, quit fencing early on uh, at 16, 17 because I hadn't qualified for a junior world championships. And I remember I had an injury at the time and I was like, what, you know, what am I doing this for? Uh, but there was something in the back of my head that kept telling me, you know, keep going, you could do this. Uh, but at, at the time, it was hard to, 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 to always understand it uh, because I was, I was trying to get results quickly. And uh, sometimes I, 
I, I had a good year, I'd get good results, and the next year I'd have bad results, and I wouldn't understand what the heck was going on. Uh, so it, 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 just a patient, it takes a lot of time to get good at things, to gain experience, especially in fencing, uh, whether you're against opponents who have different, you know, every opponent's different. You have to learn how to deal with that, the psychological ups and downs of a combat sport. Uh, so it's very important to be patient, uh, mm. and and that you know in our time in our days now is getting harder and harder. <laughs> That's definitely <laughs> that is definitely true. Yeah, I wanted to dig into that one point you said. Like one year you have good results, one year you have bad results. Mm. Very often you see, especially in young athletes, that their identity is kind of attached to the results. So if you stand in front of one young athlete who had a good year the year before and now has a bad year what would you say yeah i i would really say to 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 keep working at first of all really assess um what what do you think went wrong would, like really look at yourself on video and see what it what are you doing or that you think you know on, on matches that you lost what were you doing wrong and and just start putting in the time to work on those things and be patient because you had a good year maybe because you um you you know maybe you weren't thinking about the consequences you were just being you And then maybe you had a good year and thought you had to have a better year the next year. And then sometimes that plays on your head uh, mentally. And then you start making, you know, certain mistakes that you maybe weren't making or people have caught on to you and they've, they've made adjustments and they know how, to, how you're fencing now, right? Like for my sport or they know how you're, what you're doing. Uh, so it's very important to really observe what are you doing? What can you get better at and start working on weeks and eventually it's going to come back out and you're going to get more confidence back. And that's, that's what happened with me is that I, I sat down and really evaluated, okay, well, what did I, what happened last year? I mean, I didn't do very well. It's because you know what? I, I just, I kept sort of doing the same thing and people caught on and I didn't, I didn't make adjustments. And now I have to, I have to work on these things if I want to keep going to the next level. So, you know, having a bad year is actually good because it actually, Having a bad year early is good because it actually makes you start focusing on things that you should be working on from a young age. And then it comes out later on where you become solid in that area and you're able to, to overcome much more different types of opponents. So uh, I think it was actually a good thing for me. So it's kind of you have to innovate yourself every time. Yeah, right? you, so. yeah and you have to keep going. Uh, you have to keep going through those times. Like it's, it does, it's actually a good indicator that, oh, I have something to work on. And it should be a motivator and not see it as an obstacle, even though in the moment it does not seem that motivating. But uh, it's actually a, a little signal that, hey, you know, you have things to work on and it's actually going to make you better at the end of it. What are the habits that make you a successful person or athlete and or athlete? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I was always uh, someone who, you know, I, I, I didn't miss many practices. I kept going uh, to all the practices. Uh, I wanted to get better. Uh, I, you know, it's something that I, I've always wanted to, to feel like I'm improving. Uh, so I always like to get better, to go to practices, try not, not miss too many because, uh, you know, those things add up over time. Uh, so I think that's, that's mainly what was a differentiator. Uh, and eventually, you know, I, I started at 12 years old with, um, you know, another 25 athletes and, I was the last one standing uh, after 15 years and just because I kept going back to practice, you know, I just kept going back and I kept going back. And obviously, you know, there were times I, I, I loved it, times I didn't like it as much, but you have to stay uh, emotionally detached from your ups and downs and try to just have a longer vision because that's what keeps you going. So, you know, at one point it's like, okay, I want to make the national team, you know, okay, I want to make the international team going to the world, the cadet world championship. So the under 17, okay. Now I want to make the junior world championship. So these mini goals are what keep, you know, keep you motivated more than just the ups and downs of every day or every competition. So that's why I kept coming back and, and, and that's what kept me going uh, and, and made me want to get better. So I think that's important to have short, you know, you have your long-term vision, but the shorter term goals are good habits to have and to give yourself so that they're, they're achievable and that you feel good when you do them and then you can get on to the next one uh, without just saying, you know, I start from day one, I want to make the Olympics but you're far away, you know, so it could really be discouraging if you're just trying, I want to make the Olympics and, you know, you're 12 years old and you're having bad days and you think it's too far away. You have to break it down to smaller goals. And that was something that helped me keep going. Hmm. And when we speak about routines, do you have a morning routine? Uh, I have during my, uh, I have my, during the competition days, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, not, not specifically. I, uh, I, I try to just, you know, be consistent going to my practices, going to, to, to workouts and things like that. Uh, I don't have anything specific, but I do have, 
uh, before competitions where I, I do a lot of visualization, um, uh, you know, a, a week before, a day before, and then, you know, the day of, I'm, 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 I want to be ready to, to encounter any situation and not be flustered by it, not get nervous. And visualizing and putting yourself in scenarios beforehand really helps. Uh, so that's definitely something I use. Uh, because uh, in fencing, there's so many things that could go wrong. You have an opponent who's unpredictable. You have yourself who could make, you know, un un unforced errors. And you have a referee who in Sabre has a lot of a lot of input and makes a lot of either mistakes on purpose or by accident. And you have to live with that and you have to understand how to deal with those situations. So you could have a lot of things that destabilize you mentally. And if you live through them beforehand in your head, um, at least you, when you get to that point, you could say, oh, okay, I thought of a plan or I thought exactly when this would happen. What am I going to do to recover? And you're less nervous in the moment and your body reacts a little bit better from what I've seen. So you're visualizing situations as well as emotions? Yeah, so I, I visualize myself um, doing certain actions well, executing them properly. But I also visualize, you know, things going bad or make, getting a bad call. And then how do I deal with it? What do I do? Uh, you know, th maybe some uh, tell myself a word. Do I take a little moment, back away before getting back onto my, my, my stance, my ready stance and not try to rush in too quickly? Uh, because that's in the past, uh, it's all these mistakes I've made where, you know, a referee does a bad call, you don't agree with it, you get upset, you try to get it back, and then you're rushing too much and you lose the next three points, you know. Uh, and it's a huge, huge uh, issue in fencing. So it's important. That that's why, you know, with experience, you get even better at dealing with these situations. But visualizing them, you know, in any sport, any type of situation that could go that goes well, see yourself doing well um, is, is good. But also seeing, you know, okay, what if I do that? How do I recover from a bad situation? You know, that's, mm. that's important to be ready for that. And then how do you prepare yourself for important moments apart from visualization? Oh, yeah, so uh, it's definitely um, important moments. A big part of it is, is not uh, overemphasizing the consequences of, you know, uh, of the moment. So let's say I, I just had a big competition last week in Toronto, which counts for a lot of points. And in the past, I would be thinking too much of, oh, you know what, I just need to come in. I need to come in third or second, and then I'm going to get these many points, you know. But then I would I would get anxious because, like, imagine if I don't, then I'm so far behind in the points for this qualification. And when you think of the outcomes, that's what makes you nervous. But when I think of, okay, well, how am I going to how am I going to beat these guys? I'm going to, you know, work on my like in, in my specific issue, like small steps, change of rhythm, you know, um, keep your back leg, you know, really firmly planted, push it off that. And when you get into the actual actions you need to take to do well your mind just starts finding solutions and starts getting good at it instead of worrying about outcomes because you can't control that. The only thing you can control is your arms and your two legs in fencing, right? So how are you going to use those uh, to get your result? Because if you use them well, it doesn't matter. You're going to start beating people and, and you're going to get to the outcome. But it's very important for me for a big competition anymore not to think of the outcome, but more about how I want to fence, how I want to perform and what I want to be doing in, in specific situations. And that actually makes you way more relaxed because it's as if you have a plan instead of just, of, uh, uh, you think it's just going to be an outcome without a plan. So uh, putting in a plan in place of how I want to perform is, is very important for me. Hmm. Interesting. And then uh, just something popped up in my mind. You said like in fencing, especially in Sabre, it's the attacker who's um, evaluated a bit higher, right? In terms of getting a point. Yes, There's also one thing I think the ninjas or samurais, my son told me. <laughs> um, they said, if you have too much emotions in a fight, you're probably going to lose. Yes. So how do you get that balancing act between being the aggressor in the fight, but still staying calm? Yeah, uh, that's, that's also something that's very difficult because... Uh, if you've ever seen a saber fencing match, uh, there's a lot of yelling. There's a lot of uh, emotions. After a point, you yell a lot because, you know, you're excited. It took a lot of energy, but also it helps to influence referees from time to time when there are difficult calls uh, to sort of say, well, it was my point. When they're a little bit in the gray zone, it, it, it does help sometimes. Uh, so you have to use that emotion in the moment. But what's important is those five, six seconds you take to get back onto your, your guard line, which is to, to reset. How do you reset between those emotional moments? And that's really important. Uh, and the, the way you do some people take breaths, some people take a couple more steps back, 
Uh, they tie their shoes. They, they they fix their blade a little bit. They they talk. They ask the referee for some more follow up information of why it wasn't their point or something like that. Everyone has a different way. You do a little specific movements with your legs before getting onto the, back onto your guard just to make sure you reset. Uh, but it's important to 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 disassociate the emotions really quickly after every point uh, and having 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 tactics to do that because if not. Uh, like you said, you sometimes get over emotional. Maybe it'll work for a point or two, but after that, you start making mistakes. You're over anxious, over eager, and you overcommit. And then uh, an experienced fencer is going to be able to capitalize on that and 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 really exploit it. So um, something, yeah, it's very important to have those little tricks that you can use uh, to reset between each point. And that's what the best guys do. What would be one of the ta tactics that you're using or anyone uses just to get an idea? Yeah, so sometimes what I'll what I'll do is, uh, like I said, I'll I'll take you know usually uh, after a point, uh, you finish the point and you could you know walk by your opponent or take your time to get back to your line just to extend the time between the point and getting back. So I'll get back to the edge of my strip, open up my mask, uh, wipe some sweat off my face, put it back down, and I'll, during that time I'm just thinking of what I want to do next, what just happened, and then go slowly back to the guard line. Or you could ask, take the talk to the referee. To get some extra time, being like, "Hey, um, you know, what was the point? You said this was against me, okay, but uh, I didn't really agree. But why did you say that?" So then you ask for a follow-up uh, clarification. Sometimes you might not agree, but it gives you more time to understand and also to think of your next point as well. Uh, you know, your blade sometimes could be a little bit crooked. You say, "Sorry, I'd like to take a couple more seconds to to straighten it out You're on the side of the strip." Buys you some time there. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they tie their shoes. They, you know. They, they, they take uh, they take a little bit more time doing things. Uh, so uh, everyone has a different tactic, but it's important to have something. And that's where visualization comes in too, of, of thinking, where it ties in, of thinking, how do I react in this situation? What, what am I going to do as a tactic? What am I going to use? So you don't have to be thinking about that in the match. You already have it planned out, what you're going to use to buy more time or to reset. So it's very important. And something I didn't do enough of as a kid, I would just get back right to the guard and like, next point, next point, next point. Before you know it, the match was over. I'm like, what the heck just happened? You know, I, I wasn't taking the time because every point in saber fencing specifically is very quick. It lasts between, you know, maybe two to five seconds. Hmm. And uh, you don't have a lot of time in the point to, to make decisions. You have to adjust on the fly. You have to have made a preconceived decision, but be ready to adapt. Uh, but if you go back, and back to back to back very quickly, you could end up being on a bad side of momentum of the other opponent and you don't know how to break it. And you end up losing very quickly. So it happened to me a lot in the past. Okay. How do you overcome setbacks? Uh, yeah, it's um, I've had a lot of them. So it, it, it's always always to go back to the basics of of what what went wrong to really establish that and try to try to improve upon it and instead of um, you know doing the self pity or being too much of a you know, ah, uh, you know, this always happens to me or I never make it on the big stage or, you know, because then those thoughts just keep repeating themselves. And then no matter what you do, they poison every type of training you do, every competition. When you're, when you're tight, tight, tight matches, you have that, those thoughts coming into your head. You don't think you could win them because you always end up losing. So um, in the past that happened to me too is when, you know, you'd have setbacks, you would get down and you're like, my God, I'm working so hard and it's not working. And I'm not meant for this. And those thoughts really have an impact on your performance, on your physical, you know, in, in your physical posture, the way you, you perform, the way you act, the way you train. So it's very important to always look at a setback as just an opportunity to figure out what went wrong and to learn uh, instead of just seeing it as uh, a, a, a negative outcome on your performance and saying that, you know what, I'm not meant for this or I wasn't good or I'm not good enough uh, because then it'll just affect the rest of your performance. So you see people who win get more confidence and then always seem to have this this confidence because they believe they could keep winning and they keep keep doing good and people who lose sometimes if they don't if they don't treat it well they just get into a vicious cycle of losing and uh, no matter what they do even if they have good matches against good guys when it gets close sometimes that's when the difference of confidence comes in is that the guy is used to winning and seeing things as positive will find a way to win in the last points the guy who loses finds a way to lose and uh, in sports, psychological sports and, and physical, you know, sports like fencing, you have to mix both physical and mental at the same time. It's, it's, it takes a lot, so you have to be very confident. Hmm. Okay. Who's your role model and why? Yeah, it's a, I get asked that question a lot. And um, 
um, I, I, I have people I, I looked up to who are, you know, who I don't know, you know, like an athlete like George St. Pierre, right? He's, uh, he's, he's an athlete of one of the best fighters in the world of all time. And he's from Montreal, from Canada. He's done some great things, been a true professional in and out of the UFC octagon and uh, read his book uh, during my time when I had a concussion and going for the Olympics. So it helped me a lot. And I actually got to meet him a couple of weeks ago, actually. So it was a big, uh, big moment for me. Um, but I like to also get inspired by people who are around me and on a day to day basis, not people who I just see on, you know, on Instagram or on TV, because you don't really know, you know, they could say stuff and you could see some things they do, but you don't really know these people on a daily basis. So the real people who really inspired me through, you know, all my life were, were my grandparents because they came from, uh, from Greece, um, with nothing, my grandfather, and he opened a restaurant, uh, in, in Ontario in Canada. And he's been working in that restaurant for 45 years every day uh, from, you know, morning to night. And I've seen it like it's not just a story. Like I, I was, grew up in it and he's 76 years old and he's still there. And uh, he's the hardest working guy I've ever met. And he never, you know, uh, he was always trying to help me whenever he could. And it, it always it was always something that I would think about when I had tough times and when I was training. And I'm like, you know, he came with nothing. He created a life and he gave you an opportunity to do this and he, you know, you can't, you can never complain. Uh, and this guy has does the hardest work you've ever seen. He's at 76, still 12 hours a day running a restaurant with, you know, 40, 30 employees. And uh, he's, 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 he's my idol because the, he, he was there. And all my grandparents were very hard workers. So um, I can't ever complain or have, you know, be down on myself because these guys have, have done so much more. So it was always something that, that really pushed me. And, yeah. and because there was in my immediate circle, I was able to see it every day. Hmm, cool. What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? Um, and that's a, that's a tough one. I've, I've, I've had a lot of different advice, but um, there's, not, there's, not one, um, there's not one particular thing of advice that, that someone gave me. It just my, my, my parents would, would give me some good advice always, was always to, to do what I loved. And, and that, that was also lucky of me that, You know, my parents didn't ask me to worry, like, what is this fencing? What are you doing? You know, why are you doing this? They always, you know, to do something that I loved. And that really helped give me the confidence to keep going and not feel bad about it or feel like I'm wasting my time or, uh, you know, what am I, you know, you know, what, what's, what's my purpose? So uh, I think my parents telling me that as a kid was always something that helped me, you know, try different things and not care about what other people thought. How does a typical training day in the life of a fencer look like? Yeah, so we have um, a lot of things you have to work on in fencing. So first of all, you have, you know, your technique, right? You have, you know, your basic, you know, hitting different parts of the body, blocking people's attacks, uh, you know, uh, lunging, uh, movement. You know, you have to move in, in small steps and squat position very quickly with your arm being very available and quick to come out, very coordinated. So you have to practice a lot of technique over the years. But the problem in fencing is that, You have to be very good at technique, but if you're not good at applying the right choice of action at the right time against the right opponent, you could be the worst fencer in the world even though you train every day. Uh, so that's, that's a, a tough part of the sport of, and a combat sport is that every opponent is a different puzzle and is a different person. So you can't just you know, be a robot and just do your technique uh, even though you need to have very good technique under high-stress situations. But if you don't choose your actions properly, uh, or choose the timing of actions or the distance of when, you know, if you do things very, they look very well, but you don't hit the opponent because he's too far or he's too close and he gets you, well, then it's useless. So you need to train tactics as well. Uh, and that's an important part. And it's, you know, tactics is, you know, when do I lunge at the opponent? When do I make him, you know, come at me and he thinks he's attacking me, but I'm actually going to block him or, you know, and that takes a lot of understanding how opponents' weaknesses are and their strengths and seeing how to nullify them. And, That's what takes so much time in fencing to get good at because as a youngster, you could be very quick and aggressive and, you know, it could get you some points, but an experienced person will quickly find a way to make you go into their game. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of tactics that you have to train with, technique, uh, physical, you know, agility, uh, core, uh, explosiveness, uh, because when you want to execute your actions, you have to execute them quickly and efficiently. So that's where technique comes in and physicality. Uh, but it's a very complete sport uh, because, it, it, like I said, You could always maximize your own strengths to nullify someone else's strengths. No matter, you know, there's there's people who are six foot two in fencing, six foot five. There are people who are five foot, you know, eight. 
five foot nine, and they, they all find different ways to maximize their bodies because um, everyone ha- could find a way to win, and that's what I like about it. So um, I think it's uh, it's a sport that really develops all aspects of your psychology and pers- and personality as well. And how long is uh, is a fight? Uh, up to how many points? Uh, so it's up to 15 points, uh, and it lasts around uh, 15 minutes uh, on average. Uh, mm. So it's uh, you know it's it's. It's it's it goes quite by quite fast, but it's also high density, right? You said the uh, work to rest ratio is maybe five seconds on and then another six seven seconds off. Yeah, exactly. So like you know three, you, you, it's very quick. We do some actions, go back and forth, and then you take some time to get back on, uh, and then restart. So you have to have a lot of on off on off switch, uh, being able to be on really quickly and really on, and then be able to recover quickly so you could be on again you know so mm. that's uh, that's that's a lot of the type of you know sp- you know sprints and plyometrics and things like that that we have to we have to use mm. okay cool yeah do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed um i could nominate i i, I interviewed him recently he's a very interesting guy he's uh, also uh well he's he's a he's a fencer though from another nation from germany so I don't know if you want to do another fence or so. Maybe I'll I'll find someone else. I'll um, I'll I'll think of a name and I'll I'll get back to you. Okay, I think okay. I saw I saw that one on your yeah yeah on, yeah on your he's, podcast he's very now. Cool. yeah because you said from other nations so I I could I, from him I could I could get uh, he's he's really interesting but uh, I'll I'll get someone else to, I'll I'll send you an email. Oh why not? I mean we can yeah, yeah. Be cool. is is his name Max Hartung? Yes yes yeah 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 yeah. yeah. So we, we would have two German speaking uh, English with yeah, each other. Exa- exactly, exactly. He's and he's very well spoken and uh, does a smart guy too. And he's mm. he's now he's he's currently ranked number uh, two or three in the world now in my weapon. So he's very uh, yeah. very good guy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting because yeah. also um, it's long ago. I think it was in the eighties in Germany. There was a school that was very famous for fencing in Tauber Bischofsheim. And yes, yeah, coach, I've, been, I've been there. It's amazing. The, the coach yeah. back in the days, his name was Emil Beck. I think he's not around anymore. Yeah. But it was very famous as um, him being able to produce athletes after athletes. Yeah, Tauber's a so, legendary club. Tauber Bischofsheim is a very legendary place. Uh, so it would be cool to hear yeah. what Max has to say. Yeah. Hey, um, speaking about your interview, you have a really cool podcast. I listened to a few episodes, The Olympians Podium. Yes. You interview Olympic athletes, and what yes. was your motivation to start that podcast? Yeah, so um, I, I I decided to start it because, I, like I said earlier, I, I went to it was after Rio, so I went to Rio the Olympics, and uh, there were two reasons I wanted to start it. First of all, I was there and I started talking to my fellow Canadian athletes, and everybody had some kind of crazy story. You know, I ha- I was talking to them about my issues, and then they were telling you know I I was on a track, and uh, one of my my friends he. He was a track cyclist and he flew off the track and hit head first onto a pole and he was, you know, knocked out for like two days. Everything was broken. Uh, another one went and did a dive. He was a diver. He fell off a, fell off a diving board and fell into a ditch and broke his ribs and his face. And it, it was ridiculous stories that were life-threatening, you know. Mm-hmm. And I found that, you know, it, in the Olympic coverage, there's, you know, for, for about, you know, five months before the Olympics, uh, you know, some things are covered, some things are not, but, um, you know, it's not always easy uh, to to follow all these stories. So I said, you know what, I want to go out and do this because two Olympians talking about their stories and the lessons they learned could really help a lot of people out there overcome their own setbacks, you know. Mm. So I think that was that was an important part of it. And uh, I, I, I just, another thing I didn't like is that I was on Facebook one day and I was seeing all these pe- these ads of people, these self-help gurus and nutrition gurus and lifestyle gurus and coaches and telling us how to do things and live our lives and be good at business and be good at this and i was like who are these guys nobody knows who these people are they just appear out of nowhere but olympians have been doing it for many years that's very well documented there's no uh there's no lying there every result is is noted so you know these guys went through things and they have things to tell you that you could actually believe and trust instead of just someone who paid an advertisement on facebook and says he's a guru now you know so i was kind of tired of hearing that i was like you know we're gonna have some really meaningful conversations about you know who these people are normal life things they've done and uh so far i like i like doing it i love doing it and it's something i want to keep doing 
Uh, very difficult with a hectic schedule. I have not to do it, you know, consistently as I want. But I have a couple of more that I filmed uh, that I've recorded in the back. So another three or four that I'm going to be releasing uh, shortly after the after the World Championships and the Pan American Games. So if anyone would like to tune in, we have some great stories. The Olympians podium. It's on uh, iTunes, Spotify, every uh, every podcast outlet. And uh, let me know what you guys think too. Yeah, I will definitely link that up. And yeah. um, your videos stopped working but oh, i can really? still hear you it's it's okay as long it's as i can hear you it's fine okay but uh, definitely i cannot agree more with what you just said i think that was also the reason why i started what i'm doing now first and foremost i train olympians and i know in some sports you don't receive the media attention that other sports receive but yeah. these guys definitely give everything they have for their sports so i wanted to share their story first and foremost And secondly, what you also just said, you know, there are so many people who shout that yeah. they know something. Yeah. But as you said, I mean, athletes have done it over and over again. And they kind of, they have walked the walk and not only talked the talk. Right? Exactly. I was, I was so tired of seeing so many yeah. of them like a uh, resilience coach. It's like, what is that? You know, you just go around telling people how to be resilient. But like, what, where is your story? You could invent anything. There's nothing on you. So I was tired of that, you know, so. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Hey, where can people find you? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, you know, Joseph Polo Sifakis or J underscore Polo on, on Instagram. But if you write my full name, it's a little complicated name. But if you write it, you can find it on all the outlets. And uh, Olympians Podium, the Olympians Podium. So it's all, uh, you know, one word, well, one word on, on Instagram. But if not... Uh, Uh, online, I have a website, theolympianspodium.com, and I'm also iTunes, uh, Spotify, all that stuff. So um, find me there. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> really cool. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely, I will link that up. I listened to quite a few episodes. It's pretty good stuff. I like yeah. it. I do Thank like you. it. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Joseph, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Christian. Really appreciate it. And uh, happy, happy uh, to be a collaborator on this. I know we... Uh, We have similar goals and it's good to see people doing uh, similar things. For sure. We join forces. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm very excited for it. Awesome. Have a good okay. day.